This is going to be a short video about placing a central line and this is focusing on the operator point of view to go through the kit and all its parts. Now kits can be different from institution to institution so there may be some variability in the equipment that you use. First of all we've opened the kit and we have style process in place and this demonstration will focus more on the kit and its parts rather than full style technique or the central line placement itself. So we're going to get rid of all the paper, get it out of our way, remove some of the inserts and informational packaging, make sure that the 4x4s are where we want it, and then we have the sterile sheet that we've opened into our field. We're now going to place the sterile sheet on the probe. We're going to open up the wrapping, and this wrapping is sterile, so we'll use that as a keyboard cover so that we can clip images during our procedure. We're now going to take the sheet, which is a plastic sock. We're going to stick our hand through the open end, and invert the sheath over our dominant hand. The probe has already been prepped and is in the holder with some non-sterile gel on it. We're now going to grab the probe and unfurl the sheath over the cord, secure it at the top, and place the rubber bands so that we can hold the sheath in place with the bundle of gel at the top. Once again, smoothing out any air bubbles in the gel layer and securing the sheath in place. We'll now place it in our sterile field and we're ready to go. The next step is we're going to open up the syringes that we'll use for our lidocaine. You can see that this kit has two syringes because of the needle safety technique that we can only use the syringe once. So we have one for lidocaine during the procedure and one for sutures. We're going to now get the end caps for our catheter. We're going to remove the white caps that protect the edge of the catheter to prevent anything from falling in it during shipping. And we're going to place the caps on all two of the three ports. We're going to cap the blue and the white port, the mid and middle port. We're going to leave the red cap, which is the distal port, open so that we can thread our wire through it. We're going to remove the seal on the syringes and we're going to evacuate any air. Now using that syringe of saline, we're going to flush the catheter. Because the caps are in place, we're going to have a column of saline within the blue and the white ports. And you can see that we leave the catheter cover on as we're flushing and that allows any saline that's ejected through the catheter as we're testing it to surround the catheter itself. And the reason for this is there's a layer on the catheter that's saline activated to help it be more slippery and slide through the soft tissue. And you can see we've tested all three ports. The catheter is covered with these items which allow it to become saline activated and a little slippery so that it slides through that soft tissue for insertion a little easier. Now if I have the catheter cover on while I'm flushing, the saline stays around the catheter and activates this layer. Next is I'm going to get my wire prepared. I'm going to slide it in and out and make sure it threads well. There is a port on the top that I'm going to inject a little bit of saline through. This is purely more style, although this gets the air out and lubricates the wire. And the holder is made so that there's an entry port and an exit port that you can flush with saline if you want. The next step is I'm going to take the skin lock and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to spread that white wing, which I have to break the seal on. And it's much easier to do now before I place the catheter than once my hands have blood or gel on it and while I'm trying to secure the catheter. The next step is I'm going to get my lidocaine prepared. I'm going to take the glass ampule. I'm going to swirl to get the air bubbles out and I'm going to crack the top with a 4x4. And the reason I use the 4x4 is in case any of the glass in the ampule shatters, it doesn't cut me. The next is I'm going to take my lidocaine syringe and the filter straw. This replaces a filter needle so it doesn't have a sharp end. I'm going to get rid of a piece of paper. And using the filter straw, I'm going to draw up the lidocaine. You use the filter straw so you don't accidentally drop any glass shards. I'm going to evacuate the air and I'm going to fill up both lidocaine syringes now so that I have the lidocaine drawn up so it doesn't spill out of the ampule later. I'm going to draw one up with a little bit of lidocaine for suture anesthesia and one with a little bit more for the soft tissue anesthesia for central line placement. I have the two needles. I have a longer needle for the procedure lidocaine and a shorter one to just numb up the subcutaneous tissues for the suture placement. So now I have my two lidocaine syringes ready. Next, I'm going to make sure all my parts that I need are in areas that can easily reach it and remove some extraneous things. I'm going to prepare the suture by opening it. And I like to have the needle op out so that I can easily get to it later. But so that I don't have any sharps exposed, I place it within the styrofoam needle holder. And I have the suture still within the cover on the side. 
I'm going to place my introducer needle onto my syringe, making sure my bevel is aligned with my numbers, and make sure all the different pieces I'm going to need in order are easily accessible to me. So now I'm going to take some of the sterile gel and place it on the patient that's already been sterilely draped. I'm going to put some on the skin there. You don't have to use the whole packet, just enough so that you can visualize without getting too much gel in your way for the procedure. I'm going to take a look at where my vessel is. You can see that I'm looking at the ultrasound screen and localizing it, capturing an image. And now I'm going to take my procedure lidocaine needle and I'm going to inject the skin and subcutaneous tissues in the area I've marked. You can either do it by marking or in real time under ultrasound guidance, whichever is your preference. Just make sure the area that you're injecting with lidocaine is actually the place where you're going to place the introducer needle and you're not off axis. Something to note on the lidocaine syringe, there is a small peg at the end of the plunger. And the reason that is there is for a needle safety technique for this type of syringe. When you've injected all of the lidocaine, which you can see here, once the lidocaine is injected, that peg engages. And when you pull the plunger back, it pulls the needle within the barrel of the syringe. The needle is now no longer exposed and you will not accidentally stick yourself. However, the syringe is no longer usable. That's why there's two lidocaine syringes, one for the procedure and one for the skin for suturing. Next, I'm going to make sure that I have everything easily accessible. I'm going to take my introducer needle and I'm going to visualize the vessel in a short axis. You can see here, this is going to be a short axis out of plane technique, although my preference is for in plane. This is just a demonstration showing one method. We're going to puncture the skin. I'm going to make sure my needle and my probe line up. And once I have everything lined up, you can see that I'm mainly focusing on the ultrasound screen as I guide my needle in. I'm visualizing my needle and walking it down to the vessel in a short axis technique. I've aspirated blood at this point. The syringe comes off. And now I'm going to grab my wire, which is easily accessible. And I'm going to thread that through the needle into the internal jugular vein. And you can see that I'm threading and I'm advancing in a moderately fast fashion without any resistance. The needle comes off, and at all times I maintain control of the wire with my hand on it. I now take my ultrasound probe and visualize the wire entering the vessel, making sure it's in the IJ, and that looking at it in both a transverse and a long axis tells me that it doesn't enter the wrong vessel, curl in the vessel, or puncture the posterior wall. Now that the wire is in, we switch to the other model. I'm going to take the 11 blade, puncture the skin, to make a small nick so I can fit everything through. Once again, you can note that my hand is holding onto the wire without letting go. Next step is taking the soft tissue dilator, threading it over the wire. I'm gonna advance it through the soft tissue, holding low to the skin and in a twisting motion, advance the dilator into the subcutaneous tissues. Advancing it less than I had to advance the needle, making sure I'm dilating the soft tissue and not the vessel wall itself. Next, I'm going to take the catheter and be ready to thread it. I'm going to take it out of the sheath holder, and it is going to be a little slippery now because the coating is activated. I'm going to hold onto the wire, brace it against my fingers, and thread it through the end of the catheter. And as I feed the wire back, it will exit the red port, which is the distal port. And that color port will be different based on your manufacturer. Now, holding the wire on the further end, I'm going to thread the catheter in, not advancing the wire with it to a depth that's appropriate for the site that I'm inserting and the patient. I'm going to place the wire down, keeping it straight. If you curl the wire as you remove it, when you let go, it unwinds and you can spray blood around. I'm now going to cap the distal port. So all three ports are now closed to air. I'm going to aspirate out all of the air and blood in the red port and flush. The white and the blue port have a solid column of saline in, so I just have to draw blood into the tubing and then I can flush it through to prevent any clotting making sure I'm not injecting any air, but just saline. Now I'm just going to clean the area a little bit so that I can secure it well. Next, I'm going to take the skin lock, the white wing, which has a slit down the back. I'm going to open that up and place that on the edge of the catheter there, making sure that I'm going to leave enough space for my chlorhexidine impregnated bandage or bio patch. The red clamp goes over the white to secure it in place so it doesn't fall off. And now I have four points that I can suture the catheter in place to keep it secure. At this point, you can either place the chlorhexidine impregnated bandage or begin to suture. I prefer to suture one site in 
to secure the catheter in place before I place the bandage. And you can see that I'm making sure there's enough space between the skin and the catheter edge and the wing so that I can secure the chlorhexidine bandage in place when the suturing is done. I generally will use a two-handed tie and I'm going to suture down to the skin first so that there's a knot on the skin and the catheter is not directly sutured onto the skin causing pressure. As I thread the straight needle through the wing hole, I'm threading the dull end first so that I'm not advancing a sharp point towards my hand. I'm going to loop it through a few times. And once it's through, I am now going to tie a knot to secure the catheter to the skin knot that I had placed. Using my scalpel, I'm going to trim off the edge of the suture material. The catheter is now secured at least at one point, and I'll place my chlorhexidine impregnated bandage. Blue up, blue towards the sky. Make sure the slit is either at 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock if you are 6 o'clock. And this allows the bandage to be taken off with dressing changes. And once the dressing is secure, I will suture in the other three points and place a bioclusive dressing when the drape is removed. And this is a brief walkthrough of the different parts of the central line kit and applying each part. Now, this focus on the kit itself, and I know there are some issues with the sterile draping and everything, but this was in order to have everything in the view for camera visualization to show you the different parts.